Marcus is from San Diego. He's the co-organizer of the SDPHP meetup, and he's going to speak to us today about behavior-driven development with Laravel. Alrighty. Oh, that's not going to work. Come on. That'll work. Michael's right. Uh, I just got on our time, or your time zone today, and then I'm going to fly back to California tomorrow, and Monday is going to be ruined. <laughs> really excited to be here, though. Um, for the next 30 minutes, we're going to be talking about behavior-driven development and Laravel. A little bit about myself. My name is Marcus Moore. I'm from San Diego, like I mentioned. I am a developer with the Diego Dev Group, and I'm also an SDPHP user group co-organizer. I gave a version of this presentation at SDPHP, and I talked for like an hour and a half, which is way too long for today. So I cut down a lot of that, um, but fear not, at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna have a site for you to go to uh, that contains all these uh, links and resources that you can deep dive the specific topics. So an overview of what we're gonna be talking about today, or not all of today, just for the next 30 minutes. Um, we're going to talk about my history with behavior-driven development, how I got to be standing in front of you talking about it today. We're going to talk about behavior-driven development itself, and then we're going to talk about behavior-driven development and Laravel. So, my history with BDD. Before I worked at the Diego Dev Group, I worked at a small school um, I built a lot of internal applications there, and when I worked there, gathering my requirements were easy because I knew a lot of the systems that we were interacting with, so um, if I got a request to pull some data from this system and then go over and send an email out for something and import it into this system, I knew, like, okay, well, generally I've interacted with both of these systems before, so I kind of know what to do. Uh, more importantly, though, is I knew the people that I was working with. Um, I was in the IT department there, and I knew generally all the staff members. So I was able to walk over to Alex's office, knock on his door, and say, hey, that thing I'm building for you, what about this piece of it? Could you give me some clarification there? And I got my answer very quickly. Um, but now, working at an agency, uh, gathering those requirements and uh, getting the acceptance criteria is a little bit more difficult because I have a lot of different clients that I'm working with and they all have different communication styles. So, um, this has never happened, but you might have a client that says, that gives you your requirements and it's like to the T. Everything you need to know is in that first uh, initial conversation, that initial document, whatever it might be. That's very rare, right? On the, on the flip side of that, I have other clients that are like, we need to build this thing. And then I kind of go like, okay, and a couple weeks later, I'm like, is this kind of what you were looking for? And they're like, no, not really. And I'm like, okay, well, let's kind of try to figure out what I could do to fix that for you. Um, most of the time, there's something like in the middle, right? Where you get a pretty good idea of what the requirements are going to be and what, what needs to be built, but there's some questions in there, right? Um, so I start to think like, who has solved this communication issue where all of the data that, or all of the details that you need when you're building an application isn't defined up front. I started to learn about like the whole idea of user stories and uh, kind of went down that path and I landed on behavior-driven <laughs> development. Now, behavior-driven development is an extension of test-driven development, or TDD. Um, it works really closely with unit testing, but it's not about testing. It's interesting. It's about helping you build the right thing. So the idea is that you can build out an entire application with TDD and um, have a fully tested system when you deliver it to the client and they're like, awesome, but this isn't really what we wanted. All of your unit tests pass, your feature tests pass, that's great, but the client isn't really happy with what they got because it's not exactly what they were expecting. So BDD, behavior-driven development, is going to help you build the right thing. The bottom line is that communication is difficult, generally speaking, as well as uh, in software. And in those requirements that you get, ambiguities are almost always in there. And, and so, 
I have to caveat this. I keep saying uh, you and we, but really I mean me. Like this is really my story, how I kind of got here. So uh, who knows, maybe you don't have this issue, but I did, so yeah, caveat. Um, you might get a, uh, a requirement that's like, we need to, or a feature request that's like, we need to be, allow users to upload specific documents. And you're like, okay, cool. Um, but I know for the rest of this application, users have to be registered and signed in. So I'm gonna assume that users for, they need to be registered and signed in when uploading this document, right? So I made an assumption there based on my understanding of the rest of the application. And then you deliver that to the client and they say, oh no, actually, sorry, we forgot in this case, the user doesn't actually need to be signed in. So now you have to go back and rework that code, right? You have to go back and make some changes there. <coughs> so the goal of behavior-driven development is to close the communication gap between all the stakeholders using real examples. A lot of times I get requirements that are kind of like hand wavy, where it's like, oh, we kind of have this idea of what we need to do. Um, the goal with behavior-driven development is to get concrete examples. And also to sh establish a shared understanding of the desired outcome because a developer's understanding of a desired outcome might be different from what the business person is expecting. Making sure you guys are on the same page is key. And also to eliminate the rework, having to go back and make those changes. It happens in three steps. Discovery, formulation, and automation. Discovery. This is the most important part. As a developer and as a person that likes to code, this is also kind of like, eh, I just kind of want to dive in and start coding. But really, discovery is the most important part of behavior-driven development. Uh, again, this enables the stakeholders to have focused conversations about what you need to build and also fill knowledge gaps. Back to real-world examples. The core of this is getting those real world examples. And I, I think, um, I keep kind of saying this a lot, like the hand wavy piece of it. And that, that was really kind of my experience is that a lot of times what I wasn't good at was getting those concrete examples from my clients. They would kind of say, yeah, generally we need to do this. And I needed to steer that back into exactly what do you need, right? I think other people have that issue as well. At least I hope I do or else this whole presentation's kind of off. <laughs> There's different methods of discovery, such as discovery workshops, example mapping, event storming, others. Um, those are just kind of up there for you to punch into Google later to do some more research. But let's take a look at discovery workshops and kind of go through that process. This is also known as the Three Amigos, which is a really fun name and why I'm giving it as an example. Not really, but it is a fun name. Um, these are gonna be short and frequent meetings between all the stakeholders. And you get to, again, get those different people in the same room with different perspectives. So the three amigos are gonna be a business person or a product owner. They're gonna be determining what. What are we building? What is this feature? What is this application gonna be doing? Uh, what's in scope for this, this sprint? That kind of thing. They're gonna express the what through user stories. The developer will also be there in the conversation and they're gonna be determining how. Okay, so the business person said, we needed to do this. And it's like, oh, okay, well actually, I know that we can integrate with this service that could handle this piece of it for us. And then we just have to write our, this thing over here, blah, 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 right? They're gonna be looking for the details and the potential roadblocks. So they might say, hey, business person, you just said a user goes uh, from here to here, but we have to have an intermediary step there that the business person doesn't know about just because for whatever reason, the data isn't gonna be complete until they complete this step or something. They're gonna be looking for those things that are gonna uh, cause problems down the line. There's also gonna be a QA person. They're coming up with the what ifs. Okay, so we're gonna be integrating with the service, but what if it's offline? Then what happens? <laughs> we're just gonna show the user an error message, tell them to repeat it later, add it to a, a queue and process it again down the line. What are we gonna do? They're determining what's gonna break. Now, I say the three amigos and uh, 
we have these definitions here, and it looks like it's three people, but generally, or in reality, what will happen is um, there will probably be a business person, uh, developer and QA might kind of be merged, and there's going to be not only three people, like you'd have multiple people in these conversations taking on these roles. So that's something to keep in mind. At the end of the discovery stage, you'll have a complete shared understanding of the application that you're building through concrete examples. The formulation stage is going to be documenting those concrete examples. We're going to document them in a natural, uh, natural language syntax that is readable by both humans and software. We're going to call those, uh, we're going to write them in feature files, and they're called feature files, and they end in dot feature. And they're written in a language called Gherkin. Gherkin tells the story through a narrative, and it's easy for non-technical people to read. This is key. It's easy for a business person to look at your feature files and go, oh, I know exactly what this application is going to be doing. This is what a feature file looks like. At the top, we define our feature. In this case, it's an Uber or Lyft type app, ride sharing. The feature is requesting rides. We have a short user story at the top. As a verified user, I want to request a ride so that I can get to my destination on time. We have a couple business rules under that that say, or that were determined in the um, previous step in our conversations. And then below that, we would have a bunch of scenarios uh, in this case, we only have one as an example, but the scenario would be specific, those specific concrete examples written out. So in my scenario that I'm showing you, uh, we're going to be making sure that users are connected to vehicles that have enough seats. So my scenario is a user request to ride for four people. Given I'm a verified user, and there's a van with five seats nearby, and there's a car next to me, when I request a ride for four people, then I should see that I'm being connected to the van. Right? So the idea is, even though there's a car right there, I'm requesting a ride with a, from a vehicle that has more seats. So I need to be connected to the van that's over there. So the given step is going to st set the state of the world. Given I'm a verified user, and there's a van with five seats nearby, and there's a car with three seats next to me, the win step interacts with the application when I request a ride for four people. Then step checks the outcome of that interaction then I should see I'm being connected to the van. Here it is again. That's a cue for me to have a sip of water. OK. So at the end of the formulation stage, our common terminology has been solidified. Our shared understanding is documented in feature files, and any new people coming onto the project can understand the application just by reading through our feature files. They know what our application should be doing through concrete examples. Awesome. On to stage three, automation. This is when we're going to start to implement the features using a combination of behavior-driven development and test-driven development. This is called the double-loop workflow. And uh, the idea is that you start to, or start to implement your behavior tests, and as you come across things that need to be unit tested, like services, that kind of thing, you stop your behavior test, you implement your service using TDD, and then when that service is implemented, you hop back into the um, BDD workflow. It's kind of hard to see, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, oh, wait, I forgot. Also, uh, as in my resources at the end, uh, there's going to be a link in there called Double Loop Workflow by Jessica Marahan. It's a very excellent um, resource to understand this. So I just wanted to shout her out because she did a very good job with, with her uh, presentation on this, on the Double Loop Workflow. So we're going to implement our features using Behat. Behat is the go-to BDD framework for PHP. It's an implementation of Cucumber. Cucumber was originally written in Ruby to do BDD, and now there's implementations in all the major languages. Behat is the one that we use in PHP. So let's talk about Laravel and Behat. Installation and setup is pretty easy. We're going to start to get into code now. <laughs> uh, it's installed via Composer, as you'd expect. Uh, after you install it, you're going to run vendor bin behat init. 
And what that's going to do is it's going to create a feature directory in your project for all of your feature files. It's also going to create a base uh, feature context class in there that you're going to use to uh, populate your, your uh, tests. So we'll see that in just a minute. You'll add your feature files to features, like I mentioned. And you'll run vendor bin behat append snippets. And what that will do is take the given win then steps that are in your scenarios and stub them out inside of the feature context file. We'll take a look at that in just a moment. Um, I just realized that the um, end steps in there, I didn't really mention that end keyword, and there's a van with five seats nearby. You could chain those under uh, given win thens. It's just uh, given win then is the main keyword. So just as a heads up. <laughs> so inside of your feature context file, you'd have something that looks like this. We have a function called I'm a verified user. And our doc block above that has an annotation that says, given I'm a verified user, that maps to our first sentence, right? Those annotations is how the hat knows to uh, map your feature or your scenario sentences to the feature context file. It's throwing a pending exception because it's saying, you need to implement this. I don't know what to do. We can implement it with something like this. We have a... Um, we use a factory to create a verified user, and we set it as this acting user. The feature context file is going to be refreshed at the end of every scenario. So everything that we want to interact with within our scenario, we put uh, onto the state of the context. We also store this user location because we're going to be using it later in our request. You might be asking, I saw that you used that uh, factory there. Is Laravel just ad auto automatically working with this? How is that happening? We actually have to do a little bit of work to get that there, or to get Laravel working with it nicely. Uh, this is what the feature context file looks like out of the box. It's just plain, ready for you to implement. Um, we can continue to implement the context, but in extend the test case that comes with Laravel, something like this. So in our constructor, we set any environment variables that we need to. We call the parent constructor. This setup on that line will boot up Laravel for you. This without exception handling, I highly recommend because you'll be able to see your errors a lot easier as you're running through your tests. And we have a before method there that has an annotation called before scenario, which will be run, as you'd expect, before each scenario. And in that case, or before each scenario, we're going to call this artisan migrate fresh. Very similar to our um, uses refresh database in our, in our normal, quote unquote, uh, Laravel tests. So now, this will run just nice. Before, it would throw an error like, I don't know how, what do you want me to do with this factory method? Now, everything's good to go. The next step, and there's a van with arg1 seats nearby. That's weird. Where did that come from? Well, Behat takes any numbers that are in your sentences, in your feature, in your scenarios, and, um, and assumes that you're going to need to use them. You're going to need to reference them. So it took that number five and passed it in as arg1. Arg1 isn't very helpful, so we could rename that to number of seats and actually implement it. This create van number of seats. And the distance from user is three arbitrary number. We could do the same with the car. And there's a car with a number of seats next to me. We say this create a car with the number of seats and the distance from the user is one. So that signifies it's a little bit closer in our example, I suppose. And you might be thinking, hey, those method signatures are very similar. They're doing very simple things. We could probably create a helper method there. Uh, I would push back on you to say, I don't know about that because we're only doing it in one place so far. But for an example, let's go through and see how that would work. The key is if we wanted to create a helper method called like create vehicle, we need to know the type of vehicle and the distance um, as variables. So we know previously that um, the number five and the number three were passed in. So you might be asking, well, how could I pass in van, car, and nearby and next to me? It's easy enough. You could just wrap it in double quotes, something like that. And now, 
when you reappend your snippets, you'll have a function at the bottom of the file that looks like this. Given there is an arg1 with arg2 seats arg3, I will say this, it's very hard to read these sometimes, uh, but if you have PHP Storm or Sublime uh, with the Behat helper, you could click in from your feature file and go right to the function that's being implemented. So I highly recommend uh, installing those plugins. Is that readable-ish? Um, so we could implement it with something like this. You could see that now our variables are being passed in as we expect. Given there's a vehicle, uh, given there's a type of vehicle with number of seats, seats dif distance from user, it's all passed in. Set our distance to three by default. If the distance from user is next to me, which is our car example, we set it to one. And then again, like we had before, we're gonna set the um, the, the vehicles on the instance. So we're gonna be referencing it later. So this vehicles in the end will have a, uh, an array with a key of car and van in there, right? When I request a ride for number of people, this is our uh, interact step, right? So we're gonna say this acting as the acting user that we set in our given step. We're gonna send a request to the endpoint with the data the location, the user location, again, that we step, set on our given step. And the number of uh, seats is the number of people that's being passed into the method. Similar pattern, we store the response on the uh, instance because we're gonna be referencing it in the next step. So let's just say this is what that route ends up matching to. We have a controller that does some work to match the user and the driver. This is a good time to TDD a service, right? Um, this, so at this point, I would go ahead and pause my uh, implementation of these Behat tests and start to test uh, TDD a service to actually do the matching for a user and a driver. Um, and in this case, like this is a kind of a generic example, like we probably need more data being passed in. That's fine. Um, just know that this is more for example sake. Um, yeah. So. Once I'm done TDDing that service, I'd hop back into my behavior test, integrate everything, wire it all up, and continue on. And let's just say we respond with a message that says, uh, Patrick will pick you up soon, right? That's the name of the closest driver. So, our um, assert check, our assert section. Then I should see I'm being connected to the van. So in this case, we just pull the response or pull the message from the response that we stored above. The name of the driver that we expect, Patrick, is the one that we said earlier, and we assert true that the string contains Patrick, which is the name of our driver. In this case, our test would pass, right? Then we would repeat this cycle for the rest of the scenarios that we determine in our uh, documentation stage. Also, mink. <laughs> Um, you might be wondering or thinking like, okay, that's awesome. We just tested a HTTP, HTTP response. We didn't really interact with like a, a normal application or a normal website. How do I do JavaScript? Well, the answer would be mink. Um, I don't have time to get into that too much, but just know that's the keyword to look up and the extension that could be plugged right into Behat. Um, and you can interact much like you would with Laravel Dusk with mink. So at the end of the autom automation stage, Real world examples drove the development of the application through a combination of TDD and BDD. The application is now tested on multiple levels, like we just said. We went through our double loops life cycle, right? TDD, BDD together. And so, discovery. Get your team together. Get everybody involved. Have conversations about what the application should be that you're building. Formulation. Document all those real world examples. Automation. Actually build the application using those real world examples. And then your client will be super happy because when you give them the product, they'll be like, yes, this is exactly what we expected. Yes. And you don't have to go back and make any changes. Well, you probably do have to make some changes, but not nearly as many as uh, previously. So at least in <coughs> my case. I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation. 
I hope you guys found it useful. The uh, resources I mentioned are going to be online at uh, that URL, the bit.ly. It'll be laricon-au-bdd. Um, I'm open to conversations about uh, BDD or test or um, development in general. My uh, direct messages are open. I'll be walking around the conference here. Please have a conversation with me. I'd uh, love to hear what we could talk about. Very weird ending. <laughs> Thank you.